uh, what is the story about this? The story is, um, it seemed to most people in America that something had gone wrong with this young man who came from a very um, upper middle class background, whose parents are well known in New Haven. His father works at at a very exclusive club, had been, has been working there for years. His father was there when, say, Mayor Lindsay was a student at Yale. His mother is a librarian at Yale. Here is a young man who has come through all of this and has attended for, for four years, I think perhaps the most exclusive private school in New Haven. And all of a sudden, for him to belong to the most exclusive extremist group, Mm -hmm. and to have died this way. So, uh, in other words, people ha were asking themselves, what happened? So I tried to talk to his widow, who's a very beautiful, extremely strong woman, and, and to his mother to find out what had happened. Now, his mother doesn't feel that there's anything, there's any radical transformation in his character. Um, I didn't talk to the father because he seemed to have been stunned still by the event. And the program would show you what the Panthers do, what they believe in, what effect his death has had. And, but most, most importantly, the program will show the, the transformation of the mother from whatever she was before to at least a Black Panther sympathizer, to the extent that having come from this tremendous upper middle class background, she had the presence of mind to call the New York office of the Black Panthers to find out what was the official uniform in which she decided to bury her son. Let's listen then to Concern, The Death of a Panther by Austin Clark. Ooh. Ooh. Mrs. Huggins, let me ask you, um, you are the mother of John J. Huggins. Could you have seen his involvement in the liberation for black people when he was growing up? Yes, I most certainly could. From the time that he was in nursery school, he was always concerned with other people. At two and a half, the children that were older than he was came to him for comfort and solace, and he was always able to put his arm around them and tell them something that would be comforting to them. We have reports from the nursery school which were sent by the teachers several pages at a time saying that he was a very um, unusual child and very concerned with other children. Never started a quarrel but could defend himself if it was necessary. You're holding his daughter in your, in your hand. Here, you? yeah. You're holding his daughter in your hand now, and I, I presume you think about him. Oh, I certainly do. Every day. I have all kinds of uh, thoughts about him and his whole life, which was really a life of frustration in so many ways, but he was able to be self-disciplined from the time that he was a small child, and the things that happened to him in later life were just being built up, I think, as his uh, development progressed through adolescence and young adulthood. Um, did he go to school in New Haven? Yes, he went to school in New Haven, starting in the elementary public school, in which he finished grade six, after which we transferred him to Hopkins Grammar School, a private school for boys, a day school, which we thought was going to be uh, beneficial to him. We later found out it was one of our really serious mistakes, though. Why was it a mistake? Because as a young adolescent, he ran uh, head-on into discrimination at all levels. Other children, his peers so-called, the faculty and the headmaster, and none of them knew how to cope with the situation, or even tried to. So then you're saying perhaps that he was the only black student, or one of the few black students at the school? He was one of the few, and the only one in his particular form each time. And we tried in every way to support him at home by attending all the PTA meetings and... Uh, taking him on vacations and uh, supporting him in every way possible, but it was to no avail. He asked to be transferred back to the public school, and he was in the public school at Hill House for one year. During that time, 
He was uh, the instigator or one of those that formed a small group called AIM. The aim of these young students was to have the school more meaningful to all students and also to be allowed to dress in a manner that was more comfortable. The school had been built with uh, very small corridors because of economy and the teachers and students were fainting because of uh, lack of circulation of air and the fact that it was too warm. However, they were accused of having wild parties without uh, supervision, which was untrue. My daughter, who was a college graduate, and my husband were here. They were just little picnics in the yard. But the problem was they had Negro and white boys and girls, and that just couldn't be countenanced by the administration at the school. Therefore, they were, uh, some of them expelled or uh, suspended, and all kinds of uh, restrictions were made on them. And also, we feel that our telephone was taped at that time or tapped. After having gone to California, you became involved in this political party, the Panthers. What were your feelings about this when you heard that he was involved? As a matter of fact, it wasn't a new discovery because he had been involved with the Hill Parents in a social action period uh, program. <clears throat> as soon as he came out of the Navy, he wanted to unwind for a while from his uh, military experience. Therefore, he took a job working at Mittler Brothers Electronics and Radar, which he had been trained to do in the Navy. And he worked in the Hill during all his spare time to the extent that his father really reprimanded him and thought he should get more rest and prepare himself more for going to college in the spring. But he said that uh, he just had to do it. In fact, he sat down with tears in his eyes and said that those are my people. And there was no way we could stop him. In February, he went down to Lincoln University and was rather discouraged to find that college courses were not very meaningful to him. They went to California and did become involved in the Panthers. We weren't really surprised at all. We didn't know a great deal about the Panther Party and their program, but uh, he kept telling us what they were doing, and we felt that his safety was very much uh, involved. And in one of the conversations that we had with him, I asked him if he had come home safely from the Navy and years of service in Vietnam and other places, only to be a civilian casualty. His answer was, and that's the way it is, Mother. Now you have his wife, your daughter-in-law, living with you. Um, I talked to her last night. She strikes me as a remarkably strong woman. Do you get that impression also? Very definitely. We're very fortunate, we think, that in his 23 years, he led such a meaningful life. And instead of leaving property or money, he left us, he left us a legacy. <laughs> Collins, could you compare for me the feeling you get in California as against the feeling you have now in New Haven? Well, uh, basically, California is a very political place, and uh, Los Angeles specifically is uh, known for its conservatism and is quite really the most racist section of California due to the fact that people have migrated from all areas of the South, you know, black and white people. And it's a known thing that there are uh, posters and uh, things of the sort, you know, asking uh, white men in Alabama, Mississippi, to join the Los Angeles and Oakland police departments. Uh, you could say that uh, California is a place for overt racism and uh, New Haven kind of hides it, you know, it's latent racism, where people are very subtle here, people are very blatant in California, and uh, it shows with the uh, police department. In Oakland, I remember an incident where uh, a woman, six months pregnant, was uh, having a birthday party for a two-year-old boy. And uh, the children were in the backyard. It was in the summertime, sort of a lawn party type thing. Her little boy and her mother were sitting in her living room. There had been a so-called robbery about two blocks from her house. And the pigs came into her house. Let's say they came in. They actually busted in, you know, and uh, began to uh, ransack her house and said that there had been a robbery committed and that they were blaming her for it with no uh, validation for it. They knocked her down and beat her. She had a miscarriage. 
they beat her mother, and they beat her two-year-old boy because they said that he looked suspicious. They beat him into unconsciousness. The woman joined the Panther Party soon afterwards. Another incident took place with uh, John, two other sisters, and myself. We were coming from a funeral home. We were seeing the body of a very, very close friend of ours who had been killed by the Los Angeles pigs. And we were followed from the funeral home, and we know this. And they stopped us, and they pulled guns on all of us. I mean, usually when they come to a car, they'll say, may I have your identification license or something, but they just told John to get out, and they had service revolvers pointed at him. And he was the only man in the car. They knew we were Panthers, and they know our cars, so they knew it was a Panther car. They started to shoot John then, but they stopped because this black woman, this old black woman, walked up and said, Mother, if you do that, I'm going to bring everybody down on you on this street. And she used exactly those words. And uh, he stopped short, and then he asked him for his identification. Meanwhile, there were at least 30 people who were gathered and sort of like protecting us in a way. Uh, they then told the owner of the car to get out, a sister named Linda. Linda got out, and they searched her purse. I mean, they do not have the authority to do this. Then they told the other sister, Cookie, and me to get out. I was uh, five months pregnant then, and uh, they got ready to search us. Cookie told them if they put their hands on her that they would find themselves picking themselves up, and she meant it. They didn't touch me because someone hollered she's pregnant, and uh, if you touch her, it'll be all over. I mean, people were actually behind us. Everybody witnessed exactly what went on. They took Linda and John. They handcuffed them first and treated them very badly. Oh, another thing that shows a perversion of the police is the fact that they spread eagle you, that is men. They make you stand with your legs apart and your hands up or hands on a car, and they uh, frisk you for weapons, marijuana, anything they can think of. They have a very strange way of playing with your genitals, and that's what they did to John because when they searched the lower part of his body, I believe that they searched his genitals about five times. People witnessed that also, and we brought that up in court. Well, they took them to jail, and they booked John on driving 20 miles in a 30-mile zone, and they booked Linda for possession of uh, dangerous uh, drugs. She had uh, some pills for asthma, she had two bottles. One bottle happened to be Dexedrine, and they said that this was dangerous drugs. So uh, John won his case, and Linda won, won hers because the charges that they booked them on were ridiculous. And uh, it all goes to show that they will pick a panther up, they will pick a black person up, they will pick up anybody that gets in their way and uh, kill them on the spot, whether or not they have orders to do so. It just so happens that they had orders at that time, I believe. That's another incident of their uh, brutality, perversion, and racism. For about two weeks prior to this, UCLA had been having meetings about the uh, high potential program. And the high potential program was similar to a transitional program where they gave them sort of like remedial courses. So John and Bunchy had seen that uh, the high potential program was basically a farce in that they were not giving blacks and Mexicans the education that they really needed to deal with the problems in the black colony and the Mexican barrios. And uh, the students were upset about it, to say the least. So they decided that they needed an Afro-American study center and black studies courses that not only dealt with black dance and black cooking and black looking and black thinking, but black political awareness. <laughs> and uh, of course, in a school as large as UCLA, uh, the administration didn't want this to happen because as soon as uh, people become politically aware and realize what is going on in the country, then they become incensed with it and eventually will try to do something about it and it often isn't too nice. So John and Bunchy Annie Lane, another person who 
was in the program. Just happened to be Panthers. They were students there. So they decided that, you know, they would go to the BSU meetings, and the BSU is the Black Student Union. They would see what they could do about changing some things along with the students, you know, not over the students' heads, but along with them. There was a community advisory committee composed of uh, the members of the Black Congress, which is an umbrella organization, which houses us organization as one of its members, and Karanga was a representative, and Walter Bremond, who was the head of the Black Congress, was a representative. Karanga decided that he didn't want the students to pick who they wanted to pick to be the head of the department, and he most definitely not, did not want the Panthers to have any say-so in it. So he brought at least 70 of his henchmen to UCLA campus uh, two days prior to the shootings. and. Uh, began harassing the students, harassing the uh, coordinator of the program, and basically uh, trying to scare the people into uh, taking him as the head or uh, taking who he proposed to be the head. And they didn't want him, and they booed him off the campus when he was speaking because he talks in riddles and he's not saying anything and he's attacking white people rather than white racism or American oppression or brutality of the police department. And uh, John and Bunchy really didn't have to say anything because the students were doing it themselves. John and Bunchy had always been eloquent speakers, friendly to the people, uh, beautiful people in general. They didn't like it because the students had begun to support what they were saying and therefore had started to support the Panther Party, and they didn't like that. And uh, Elaine was standing in the corridor after the meeting, and uh, one of Karanga's people, a punk named Tawala, walked up to her and uh, grabbed her by the coat and said something like, uh, you talk too much, because she was very influential as a black woman on the campus. And uh, she was also getting a lot of support. He told her she talked too much. And he grabbed her coat, and uh, she had on a black leather coat, and he pulled one of the buttons off. Uh, Bunchy walked by after Tawala had done this and said, uh, what was all that about? And she said, well, he was, you know, pulling on me because uh, he feels that I possibly am threatening, you know, Karanga's program. So then John walked up and asked what was going on, because he had actually grabbed Elaine, I mean, almost off the ground. And uh, both of them said, well, we'll go and see what it's all about. We'll go and talk to them. So they went to, uh, you know, find out where Tawala was, and they walked into the room, looked in the direction of Tawala, and uh, shots were fired. John fell. Bunchy began to say something and he was gone. And we believe that it was a setup. Now, uh, the Panthers that were on the campus at the time came to my house and uh, didn't say anything. I had been called two hours before and someone had said two brothers were shot at UCLA. Because of instinct and because I knew that any day John would be killed, I knew exactly you know, who it was with no names mentioned. So I was prepared when they came in, and they thought that, you know, I would be broken up. I asked one of them if John was dead, and they said yes. I said, is Bunchy dead? They said yes. So I just made coffee for everybody, and I put the cups of coffee on the sink. And we never got to drink them. I guess because everybody's mind was just a ball of madness, uh, we didn't expect to be attacked. But as soon as the brothers got to the uh, bottom of the stairs, Janice noticed a pig in a trench coat with a Riot 20 shotgun sneaking around the corner. And Janice is another sister who happened to stay at the house. And she told one of the brothers to watch out. And before he could watch out, all we could hear was, get your hands in the air. Soon after we heard this, we were told to come downstairs with our hands over our heads. Now, I'm carrying a three-week-old baby, so it is quite impossible for me to get my hands over my head. And Janice said to one of the detectives, uh, 
please don't, you know, shoot her because uh, she has a baby and there's no way she can do that. And he said, I don't care what she's got. She better get her goddamn hands over her head, just like that. So I heard him and uh, I said, I'm not putting my hands anywhere except around my baby and you can deal with it the way you want to. So uh, we went outside and it was about 5.30 in the afternoon. And in California, after the sun goes down, it gets very chilly. I had my baby wrapped in a coat. It just so happens that a uniformed policeman walked over to me and said, what's in the coat? And grabbed at it. And I said, there's a baby in there. He said, let me see. And I opened the coat a little bit. He saw it was a baby. He took the baby out of the coat and uh, searched the coat for guns. And then he poked my three-week-old baby in the sides and in the stomachs, searching her for guns. So they decided she didn't have any guns on her, so that they put the coat back around her. So all of us were without coats. We were not concealing any weapons. It just looked like hundreds of people in the street watching the whole thing. We got to the jail, to the police station, that is, uh, at around 5.30, I guess, a little after. We remained there until 1.30 the following morning. Meanwhile, I'm there with my baby. She has not been changed. I breastfeed her. They really didn't want me to let, you know, to feed her. Uh, they didn't give me any privacy whatsoever. They harassed us, you know, with words. They didn't hit any of us, but it would have been better if they had because um, of the things they said to us. Like, uh, I really didn't know whether, you know, it was confirmed that John was dead because there were some doubts about it. And uh, they asked me where my old man was, and I said, uh, I don't know, you know. And they said, well, that's what you get for screwing and not using the pill. And they said things like this all night long. And they didn't let me change my baby, so it followed that she got a terrible diaper rash. And uh, they booked us on four charges, conspiracy with the intent to commit murder, violation of the dangerous weapons control law, suspicion of robbery, possession of marijuana, carrying a concealed weapon, and another just suspicious charge, and I don't even know what it was. Nobody ever found out. There was this brother named Blue, who was a bystander, who, uh, when the pigs harassed him, he was getting back at them. So this uh, dude walked in, and uh, Blue said to him, uh, Why'd you pick up all these innocent people? You must have had a payoff for this. So the pig said, yeah, we got paid off. It was bigger than my whole year's salary, and it was done through a respectable black man in the community. And uh, a lot of us heard this, and we were really, really uptight then because it was foul enough that they were killed, but that, you know, black people would fight against black people for some money. It was outrageous. So then at about 1.30 or 2 o'clock, they took uh, the women, four of us, to Sybil Brand Institute, which is known to be a, a hellhole for women. And... Uh, they took all the men to central jail. Later on that afternoon, I saw my brother-in-law, and uh, he told me I was going to be bailed out. And uh, I had some money that belonged to John. He had just gotten paid from UCLA. They had confiscated that from my house and said, does this belong to you? I said, yes. You can pick it up when you're bailed out. I can't get the money now because they say it that I am not John's wife. We hear again from John Huggins' mother, who talks about the days right after her son was killed, just two months previously in January 1969. I would say a great many people were very impressed by the presence of the Panthers, 25 of whom came from various parts of the East Coast to attend the funeral. Their uh, behavior, or whatever you want to describe it as, was most exemplary. We had made all tentative arrangements pending their willingness to participate. It seems they had never been asked to act as pallbearers before and were very honored to be pallbearers. Due to the fact that uh, Johnny remained in the church overnight, we had a watch, an all-night watch, during this period from 9 o'clock at night until 10 the next morning. His friends and cousins rotated, each one 
or two being present at the church all during the night for one hour periods. During the night, however, the church was visited by various members of the police force who asked to see the registry, which they should not have touched, went through the names to see if there were any interesting ones to them. I believe they asked some questions. I haven't really been able to talk with all of the young men who were there to find out exactly what happened, but we were very annoyed and upset, to say the least, that this should occur at all. The Panthers were welcome in our home. They arrived from 4.30 that morning up until 5.30 or 6. Several of them spent the night here. All of them were received warmly and were fed and taken care of. And breakfast was served for 35 people the morning of the funeral, 25 Panthers and 10 people who were here in our home, without any difficulty whatever. Everyone was most cooperative. And at uh, 10 o'clock, everything was in readiness. The Panthers went over to the church to see Johnny and came back, and we all left in a group before 10.30 for the service, which was at 11 o'clock. Um, their very presence, I think, had a very sobering effect on everyone and was of great support morally to the entire family. And we appreciated their presence and the fact that they were able to come from various parts of the eastern seaboard to be with us at that time. After the uh, service, the Panthers and other intimate friends and relatives uh, came to the house for refreshments. The Panthers again were exemplary in their behavior, very cooperative, very appreciative. After having uh, eaten or had coffee, they removed their plates to the kitchen themselves and were very anxious to be helpful in whatever way was possible. Uh, this was not entirely true of some of the other people who were so fascinated by the Panthers that they forgot their own manners and were crowding plates under the piano and ashes all around the place, just unthinking, I'm sure. When the Panthers uh, decided to leave early in the afternoon, uh, many friends and relatives were amazed by the warm uh, farewells that took place between uh, the family and the Panthers, even though they expected it of <coughs> Erica and the Panthers since they were all part of the same group. But they found it uh, hard to believe that we could really feel friendly and more than friendly toward the Panthers. And many people uh, were truly surprised by it. You were telling me about the preparations for the burial and what clothes your son wore. Yes, a very good friend of the family <coughs> called and wanted to supply whatever clothing was necessary, and we told him that it would mean a panther uniform. Since we ourselves were not exactly sure of the specifications, we called the New York office to inquire and found that it meant black trousers, a pale blue turtleneck sweater, and a black leather jacket, which this young man immediately uh, gathered and brought to the house for us. And we were most appreciative because it was something we would have perhaps had a little difficulty in locating ourselves. So contrary <coughs> to the impression that, that one newspaper in New Haven gave of your son being more or less an errant from a middle class society, you really went along with all the things he believed in? Very definitely, and we hope that some of our friends will be converted too because for their own well-being it's going to be rather essential. We never thought of him as an errant boy. We were very anxious for him to complete his education, but we were really proud of the fact that he was able to stand up to what he believed in and had the guts to follow it all the way through, even to the point of giving his life for it, the cause he really believed in. Do you think that in New Haven, <laughs> as a result of what happened to your son, there are more people interested in what the Panthers are doing? Can you, do you know whether this is the case or not? We can only go by what people have said. I think they fall in two categories. There are many people that are really frightened to death and so afraid that there might be a panther group in New Haven at some time or, as they have heard, and it is true, somewhere in Connecticut. There are others that really feel motivated to find out more about the panthers because they have been maligned all the way across the country and every time there's uh, an arrest, as I understand recently happened on one of the airplanes, the two people who were responsible and had the weapons were arrested, but they also took two innocent panthers who just happened to be sitting on the plane minding their own business. There's just such a fear of uh, having uh, people that really want to help others become influential that uh, no chances are taken. We can only hope that the people that have 
been impressed favorably and are interested in finding out more about the Panthers really will do something about it. And as far as we're able to, we're indoctrinating them in every direction and telling them that if they find something wrong with the expression power to the people, to just tell us what it is. Because, because hasn't the power been in the hands of too few for too long and isn't it time for a change? Drive a man, he made a life. Don't be slow. The mud, you know, people. Get to we had political education and classes, and for the Junior Panthers, we had black history uh, classes. And the Junior Panther program uh, is for young black people from the age when they can talk until they're 16 years old. And uh, in the political education classes, we try to teach, you know, the true history of black people. We define for ourselves what power is, what racism is, what capitalism is, what imperialism is. Uh, we do the basic things that uh, black people haven't been taught to this point. John was uh, the deputy minister of information for Southern California, and therefore it was his uh, duty to teach the political education classes or see to it that they were taught. And they were informal and very, very interesting because, you see, we weren't talking to the so-called, in quote, intellectuals. We were talking to uh, people from the streets. People, as uh, Eldridge said, uh, came out of the woodwork uh, from underneath garbage cans, from below the mud, you know, people who never before had any, had any uh, reason to re relate to uh, a black movement because it wasn't for them. We believed in rapping on doors and wearing out shoes and talking to people. And so that when people came to political education classes, it wasn't a stilted intellectual dialogue. We dealt with what actually was going on in the community. That was one thing about John. He had the most patience that uh, I've ever witnessed in my life because it's a hard thing to deal with somebody who uh, you know, has only gone to third grade and really can't read. And uh, he would spend, you know, hours with just one person. See, this was a beautiful thing about him. He did not place himself above uh, anybody because really no black person is above any other one, you see. And the reason that black people think that they are is because this is one of the man's divide and conquer tactics where he makes us believe that uh, one of us is superior to the other and really we're not. And uh, John's patience made him uh, loved by a whole lot of people. And uh, he even had patience with uh, stupid whiteies who would ask, ask questions like, uh, why are we angry, you know? He would answer them and he would answer them quietly and uh, he would always give an answer that uh, people could understand. I remember once a brother who uh, couldn't read at all, and uh, we use quotations from the Red Book, Mao Zedong's quotations, as guidelines because that little book uh, holds a lot of truth in it. And uh, one day we were in class and we were discussing a chapter in the Red Book, and we noticed that this brother wasn't comprehending, and we asked him why, and he said because he couldn't read. And uh, we finally... Uh, after hours of trying to help him, I had to give up. And what he did, because of John, you know, because uh, John had been so patient with him, and it made him realize that what we were doing was really serious business and that we had to have uh, some political direction in order to talk to the people, this brother went home and had his mother read to him. So while he was becoming politically aware, so was his mother, and so was his whole family. And uh, this brother began to read, not because he was going to make a grade for it, but because uh, he knew that he would help his people if he could understand what was going on in the world. And uh, this was really beautiful. What is the Black Panthers political program? Well, we have a 10-point program which consists of uh, 10 uh, statements of what black people need 
and I say what black people need because this wasn't written by Huey Newton and Bobby Seals alone. Before Huey and Bobby uh, put this on paper, they went door to door and canvassed the community and asked them what they wanted. And they came out with things like, uh, point one, we want freedom. We want the power to determine, it, to determine the destiny of the black communities. Uh, two, we want full employment for our people. Three, we want decent housing fit for the shelter of human beings. Four, we want the end to the robbery of the black community by the white businessman. Five, we want a decent education that exposes the true nature of this decadent American society, an education that expresses our true role and uh, situation in this present day society. Six, we want all black men exempt from military service. Seven, we want the immediate end to police brutality and murder of black people. Eight, we want all black people when brought to trial to be uh, tried by a jury of their peers. And nine, we want all black men and women released from federal, city, state, county, jails and prisons. Ten, we want land, bread, housing, clothing, education, justice, and peace, and a United Nations plebiscite, a vote, to be held in the black colony in which only black colonial subjects participate to determine their national will and destiny. And you see, this 10-point program isn't demanding outrageous things, you see. To demand clothing and shelter is just uh, something that we should have already. And uh, uh, the Ten Point Program is a, is a basic thing that we work on, and uh, we're trying to implement all of these Ten Points right now. Uh, John was a dreamer, and uh, he envisioned a day when black people would be able to walk the streets without uh, the worry of uh, some hog oinking about, uh, you know, a traffic violation or spitting on the street or accusing them of robbery or anything like that in the day when black children would be able to uh, eat decent meals and uh, go to a school where they could be taught their, uh, their true history and uh, be taught the true history of the United States. And uh, he envisioned the day when all oppressed people in the world would be free.